When talking about China, some in the West only see a country constantly at the cusp of falling. From China hard landing, China collapse, to Covid is China's Chernobyl moment, to the end of Communist Party of China's ruling. Over the past decade, whenever China encountered difficulties and challenges, Western politicians, scholars and so-called China experts always repeated wide predictions about the fate of China and CPC. Needless to say, none of the predictions was even remotely right. Far from it, China under the leadership of CPC has overcome all the challenges, become stronger and is closer to the center of the global stage than ever. China is going to celebrate the 101st anniversary of the founding of the CPC, and the party will host its 20th National Congress this year as it leads the country to embark on a new journey to build a great modern socialist society in all respects and achieve national rejuvenation. Meanwhile, the Omicron flare-up in major cities like Beijing and Shanghai has been generally contained, and the economy is bouncing back with full speed, which has once again turned the wild prediction and bad-mouthing about China into nothing more than laughing stock. Why are they always wrong about China and the CPC? And why do they keep repeating such cliches? How should we deal with them? Welcome to Zito, I'm Yang Song from the Global Times. And today, let's talk about those famous but arrogant predictions about China in the past 10 years. The first prediction was made by Francis Fukuyama in 2012. China's top-down political system under pressure from a growing middle class empowered by wealth and social networks is likely to blow up at some point. Fukuyama, best known of his 1992 book The End of History and the Last Man, which argues that liberal democracy is a fulcrum of social evolution, made many predictions. His forecast about China 10 years ago seems very laughable today. But why did he believe that? He told the media that China has always been a country with a big information problem. And this is so many respects exactly the Communist Party's problem, because they do not have a free media. They do not have a local elections. They cannot really judge what their people are thinking. Fukuyama's opinion is a typical type of China collapse theory that we can see frequently in the West, and he was not alone. There were some other famous enthusiasts of the hilarious theory that used their biased knowledge to predict China in the past 10 years. Such as when Hillary Clinton said in 2011 that the Chinese system is doomed. In an interview with The Atlantic, the former US Secretary of State said that Beijing's human rights record is deplorable and is trying to stop history by opposing the advance of democracy. And of course, we will never forget the well-known China collapse theory enthusiast Gordon Chan. He frequently made predictions about China's collapse, but never gave up and just kept changing the time of the collapse again and again. Many Chinese netizens mocked Gordon Chan saying that he is the director of China's strategic Fuyu agency, a fake agency created by Chinese netizens, which aim to ridicule US decision makers and let them downplay the threat of China. More laughable is that some Chinese netizens said China should collapse in at least 100 years to cover the comrades in the United States, like Gordon Chen, so that they can keep fooling the US political elites and prevent America from bothering China's development. However, the China collapse theory also affects some mainstream scholars. David Shambo said in 2015 that the end game of communist rule in China has begun, and the ruthless measures of the Chinese leadership are only bringing the country closer to a breaking point. Shambo gave more reasons than Fukuyama, but all of them are repeatedly boring, such as the problem of corruption, the economic downward pressure, and the crackdown of so-called dissidents or foreign NGOs. Shambo used to be a US scholar that could objectively analyze China, but he changed in 2015. And this has confused many Chinese scholars who used to respect him. 
Basically, as a Chinese, I have to say Fukuyama, Shambo, Gordon Chen, Hillary Clinton, and those who have a similar opinions are the ones who don't really understand what's going on in this country. They are the ones who fail to judge what Chinese people are thinking. On the background of Fukuyama's prediction is the Wenzhou high-speed train accident in 2011 which sparked a massive discussion by the Chinese public and social media platforms. And many voices have expressed security concerns in public transportation, as well as questioned the credibility of the government over the investigation of the accident. But was the fact proving Fukuyama's assumption that CPC has failed to understand what Chinese people are thinking? Will the growing access of the Chinese middle class to the internet weaken the authority of the government? The answer is clear. Fukuyama was wrong. In terms of social media, today China has more than 1 billion web users, compared with about 560 million in 2012. Why didn't such an expansion of web users weaken the political system of China? The reason is that China has successfully developed online public opinion platforms that allow the people to express their opinions, reflect on the problems of Chinese society, and effectively warn the government to fix them. In the past 10 years, China proved that its high-speed trains are reliable, and the country has the biggest and most advanced high-speed railway network of the world. The accident in 2011 did not stop the development of China or change the people's confidence in the country. All the hot topics like corruption, air pollution, and the COVID-19 pandemic have been overcome effectively by the party and the Chinese government. The anti-corruption campaign launched by the CBC after 18th CBC National Congress has successfully reshaped a clean and healthy political environment in China and has won full support from the people. Air quality in cities like Beijing has improved remarkably in recent years, and the residents in the capital city can see the blue sky frequently compared to a decade ago. And when the COVID-19 pandemic hit China in 2020, many Chinese people were depressed and concerned. However, the CPC has once again proved that China has the best performance in saving people's lives and minimizing the economic losses. All of these facts prove that CBC can effectively collect information about the grassroots to find the problems and solutions, spot mistakes, and effectively correct them as soon as possible. After a series of hostile offensives launched by the United States against China, from the trade war to the rumors about Xinjiang, and the interruption on the reunification process with Taiwan, more and more Chinese are feeling very disappointed and angry toward the United States. Although, they will sporadically voice their concerns about specific issues, just like everyone around the globe. They clearly know that they will unshakably stand with the CPC, especially when it comes to China's national interest and the competition launched by the United States against their own country. Many Western countries might have freedom of speech, that allows people to complain about everything and even tolerate fake news, rumors, and extremist voices that can cause violence and bloodshed. But unfortunately, those Western governments have failed to find a solution of the problems of their peoples and unite the whole society to push for effective reforms. The Western-style freedom of speech is tearing Western society apart. Today, after Brexit, the rise of Trumpism in the West and a series of U.S. failures in the countries like Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, as well as the endless partisan political struggles and bloody shootings in America, we find that those famous U.S. scholars who love to make negative predictions about China also fail to judge what Americans and the people around the globe are thinking. Of course, not all predictions from other countries about China are pessimistic. But the problem is that Western media and society did not pay enough attention to these predictions. Martin Jacks made some correct predictions in his work published in 2009, When China Rules the World. Let's see what he will say about the failure of Western predictions about China. 
and why he was confident in China more than 10 years ago. China's history and its culture is so different that you can't make sense of it uh, using a Western uh, template. My book was very controversial uh, when it was published in 2009 because basically it did not accept what was then the Western common sense about China. The Chinese economic growth would continue uh, uh, for a long time to come because of its level of development allowed, uh, that, allowed that possibility. And uh, far from being uh, in crisis, in fact, support for the Chinese political system had increased and would continue to increase as long as China was successful because um, people can see, the Chinese can see, that it's worked extremely well for China, and therefore that would strengthen the political system uh, in China. China would not only remain very different, but globally, as China rose, there would be an increasing process of signification of the world. In other words, growing Chinese influence in lots of different ways um, around the world. Apart from Jax, I would like to share with you some predictions from Lee Kuan Yew about China. The late Prime Minister of Singapore who died in 2015 was a respectful and credible leader that could bridge the West and China, and earn a high reputation in both sides. For instance, as Margaret Thatcher said, he was never wrong. In 2013, Lee said the power comparison between China and the United States will be balanced in the next two or three decades and China will gain the upper hand of the competition with the United States in the Western Pacific. The China-U.S. relations will not become a U.S.-Soviet Cold War situation or a zero-sum game. The reunification of the Chinese mainland with the island of Taiwan is just a matter of time. Maybe it's too early to come to a conclusion about Li's predictions. But we can see the trend where the United States is pushing the narrative of competition with China and even trying to force the Asia-Pacific region to decouple from China. On the Taiwan question, the U.S. is also making provocations to challenge the core interest of China and the internationally recognized One China principle. What do you think of these predictions? Would you believe Li or those pessimistic predictions about China? Will China overcome the current challenges, achieve sustainable development, and accomplish its ambitious goals? Feel free to share your opinions with us. Thank you for watching and see you next time.